So I'm hoping you can all see that. History of British Holidays, Chris Heather. Yes. So um, welcome, welcome along. Um, I'm the transport record specialist and much of my time is spent trying to improve catalogue descriptions of railway documents held at Kew. And this is my interpretation of how holidays developed through time. I'm not saying that this is the definitive history of holidays. I'm sure that if you all wrote um, a similar talk, you would all come up with a very different account of how they developed. But this is the one I've put together. Um, and I've illustrated it solely with images of documents from the National Archives. So everything you see on the screen is held at TNA, all except one photo, which I'll explain later on, um, which is from my own collection. So what is a holiday? Well, one definition might be time away from work or time away from home for pleasure or simply a break from the usual routine. That's what we've come to expect a holiday to be. But the word holiday uh, comes from the phrase holy day. Holy day is a holiday, holiday. A simple day off for religious purposes, which sometimes developed into a pilgrimage involving travel. The modern holiday has grown from simply having time away from work to become big business involving long distance travel and luxurious care and attention from holiday camps to cruises and posh hotels. So this is a fairly wide ranging talk. And as I say, all the images are from the National Archives collection. Um, and I'll try and refer back to the images and explain what they are, um, even if they look a bit tenuous to what I'm actually saying. Uh, sometimes it was difficult to find images that fitted the story. So anyway, we'll see how we go. Let's move on to the first slide. Okay, so <clears throat> unlikely as it may seem, your holiday to Butlins or Mallorca can be traced back to an Italian monk in the year AD 595. The monk's name was Augustine, and he was initially the prior of a monastery in Rome when Pro Pope Gregory the Great chose him in the year 595 to lead a mission, usually called the Gregorian mission to Britain. And the mission's aim was to Christianize King Ethelbert and his kingdom of Kent. So to convert the English from Anglo-Saxon paganism. A few years later, after um, Augustine had set off, Pope Gregory wrote to him and the rest of the mission, telling them not to destroy the pagan temples, but to convert them into churches. Each church would be dedicated to a specific saint, and on the saint's day, or the patronal day, there would be celebrations. These days became known as wake days. A wake is a vigil or a watch held over the body of a dead person. So these days were special and held in memory of the relevant saint for that particular church. So we will come back to these wake days a bit later on because they kind of changed their um, meaning a bit later on. But Augustine became the first Archbishop of Canterbury in the year 597 and was known as Augustine of Canterbury. He was considered the apostle to the English and was the founder of the Christian church in England. A thousand years later, there was a monastery named after Augustine near Canterbury, and the seal that you can see on the screen is the seal of St Augustine's Monastery, Canterbury, dated 1504. So um, that's where our holidays originated from having wake days related to the church. Now, in the Victorian period, holidays as we know them were not generally taken, although the middle classes might spend time away for health reasons or to visit relatives. Alfred Lord Tennyson, the poet laureate seen here on the left um, in 1862, uh, would spend his summers at Mablethorpe and Skegness. Oscar Wilde, um, whose uh, court cards you can see in the centre of the screen there, 
Uh, he went on the traditional grand tour around Europe, falling in love with various Italian cities. And the grand tour was designed to introduce the young aristocrat to the art, history and culture of Italy and other places like Austria, Switzerland, um, France and Spain. There was no electricity in those days and limited means of copying, so the Grand Tour provided the only opportunity to see specific works of art and perhaps to hear certain musical works. I mean, today, if you want to hear Chopin, you can just put a CD on or download it. But if you wanted to hear Chopin in those days, you had to go and hear him. He, he was the only one who could do that, that music. So, um, this was all part of the Grand Tour. Women could also go on the Grand Tour with perhaps a maiden aunt as a chaperone, as depicted in E.M. Forster's A Room with a View. Even those of lesser means sought to mimic the pilgrimage as satirised in Mark Twain's enormously popular Innocence Abroad in 1869. Now we've got a map of um, Messina, Italy, uh, as it was in 1800, and Charles Dickens on the right. Little Dorrit was a novel by Charles Dickens set in 1826, a story which portrayed the Grand Tour as a rite of passage. In his book, Mr. William Dorrit follows the age old tradition of taking his family on a grand tour of Europe in order to educate them and expose them to the sites, culture and monuments that influenced Western civilization. Grand tours usually took more than a year to complete and Paris, Rome and Venice were favorite destinations. Before the Napoleonic Wars, young gentlemen were expected to go on a grand tour with a tutor lasting between one and two years. But grand tours were only for the upper classes and the aspiring middle class people. The working class would not have been able to afford it and nor were they expected to go. So we've got some uh, images. The first one is from Copy One. Copy One is, you probably know, a large collection of images, photographs from uh, people registering um, images, perhaps they wanted to make calendars or, or put, print them in books. Um, so you'll see a lot of copy one uh, material in this talk. And then the one on the right hand side shows farm workers moving into the factories in 1939. Um, and that's from the Ministry of Information uh, as a poster. So um, the working class would not usually take holidays. Generally speaking, before the Industrial Revolution, they would produce their own food and sell the surplus to buy other items. And to a large extent, people were independent and self-sustaining. They would use bartering or swapping to obtain things that they couldn't make um, themselves. Then three things that I've identified, three things changed. Firstly, the move of the population from the country to the towns. So the Industrial Revolution, basically. People no longer were so self-sustaining. Uh, they became employed, usually in factories. The move to producing, there was a move to producing one thing and then buying everything else you need with the money that you earned instead of creating what you wanted in the first place. Secondly, railways. The railways opened up previously inaccessible locations. They made some people very rich and they created massive employment. They also increased opportunities for travel, obviously, and for holidays. And thirdly, the realization that holidays could be a money-making business. In the same way that a flock of sheep could be farmed, the working class could be sold holidays travel arrangements and entertainment, and they could be used to create money. So holidays became an industry in themselves. Now, I'm sure when we go to the seaside, one of the things we all want to do is to have a walk along the pier. Pleasure piers were first built in Britain during the early 19th century. The earliest ones were the um, Ride Pier on the Isle of Wight, built in 1813. 
The Trinity Chain Pier near Leith, now part of Edinburgh, built in 1821, and Brighton Chain Pier, built in 1823. This was when steamships and railways were being introduced and for the first time permitted mass tourism to dedicated seaside resorts. The large tidal ranges at many resorts meant that passengers arriving by pleasure steamer could use a pier to disembark safely. So originally piers were just landing docks for pleasure steamers, but as the frenzy of building the railways began, and getting to the seaside to take in the sea air was so pleasurable, uh, so did the elaborate building of British piers. Brighton's West Pier used to enjoy over 2 million visitors a year. As the boom took hold, cafes were added to the entrances and bandstands to the pier end. Eventually, music halls, casinos and swimming pools became the norm on these giant fingers reaching out into the sea. A miracle of a place, an oasis of carefree abandonment that for one short week a year would let the workers enjoy a good life. A far cry from down the coal mine or on the factory shop floor, these architectural wonders help create family memories that linger in the British national psyche. During the 1950s, the end of the pier shows or seaside specials became the highlight of the summer season. Many a star entertained the crowds on piers across the country, from Laurel and Hardy to George Formby, through to the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix and The Who on Christmas Eve on Margate Pier in 1964. They also held Miss Seaside contests and Knobbly Knee contests. Um, so quite a variety of uh, activities going on. This is um, Ride Pier on the Isle of Wight. As I say, it was built in 1814 but this is a photograph from 1897 um, of the same pier. Now, one of the famous um, travel companies I'm sure you've all heard of is Thomas Cook. And on the 5th of July, 1841, the very first Thomas Cook holiday took place. It was a one day excursion to a temperance meeting, taking 500 people from Leicester to Loughborough on a chartered train at one shilling a head. Thomas Cook was a former Baptist preacher. And this, what you're seeing on the screen, is a letter from his son, John M. Cook, dated 1891 to Sir Dominic Colnaghi, who was Consul General at Florence in Italy. And he was enclosing a book celebrating 50 years of the business of Thomas Cook and Son, during which time, the letter says, the company booked travel covering over 2 million miles of railways, oceans and rivers. Their business model was refined by the introduction of the hotel coupon in 1868. These were detachable coupons or vouchers in a counterfoil book, a bit like, bit like a cheque book, which were issued to the traveller. These were valid for either a restaurant meal or an overnight hotel stay, provided they were on Cook's list. So um, let's move on to bank holidays. Here's Cleethorpes looking very busy indeed in 1909. Um, in the UK, the Christmas Day became a bank holiday in 1834. And then Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, was added in 1871, following the passing of the Bank Holiday Act. The Bank Holidays Act 1871 established public holidays, known as bank holidays, in addition to those already rec recognised in the UK, which were Good Friday and Christmas Day. For England, Wales and Ireland, there were Easter Monday, Whit Monday, first Monday in August, 26th of December, and for Scotland, they were New Year's Day, Good Friday, first Monday in May, first Monday in August, and Christmas Day. Hope you, hope you made a note of all those. Okay, we're going to go back to the Wakes Weeks, uh, which I mentioned before. It was the Lancashire cotton workers in the 1870s who helped to develop a genuine working class seaside holiday system. They saved all year to convert the traditional unpaid one week wakes holiday into seaside breaks. 
and in doing so helped change the character of many northern seaside resorts. During the Industrial Revolution, the tradition of the wakes was adapted into a regular summer holiday, particularly, but not exclusively, in some parts of the north of England and industrialised areas of the Midlands where each locality nominated a wakes week during which the local factories, collieries and other industries closed for a week. The wakes holiday started as an unpaid holiday when the mills and factories were closed for maintenance. Each town in Lancashire took the holiday on a different week in the summer, so that from June to September each town was on a holiday a different week. In 1906, an agreement on unpaid holidays was reached, which became the pattern for the wakes holidays in Lancashire mill towns. It was implemented in 1907 and guaranteed 12 days annual holiday, including bank holidays, and this was increased to 15 days in 1915. Okay, so um, now Titanic, you wouldn't want to go on holiday on the Titanic itself. But a quick word about passenger liners, uh, and in particular the White Star Line. The first ocean liners were built in the mid 19th century. Technologi technological innovations such as the steam engine and steel hull allowed larger and faster liners to be built, giving rise to a competition between world powers of the time, especially between the UK and Germany. In 1870, the White Star Line's RMS Oceanic set a new standard for ocean travel by having its first class cabins amidships with the added amenity of large portholes, electricity and running water. These ships were means of transport rather than cruise ships as we know them today. They could be luxurious, but the journey was not meant to be the holiday as such. They were just going somewhere else. As we all know, RMS Titanic sank on her maiden voyage on the 15th of April 1912, which resulted in several changes to maritime safety practices. The busiest route for liners was across the North Atlantic with ships traveling between Europe and North America. It was on this route that the fastest, largest and most advanced liners traveled, though most ocean liners historically were mid-sized vessels which served as the common carriers of passengers and freight between nations, and especially between Britain and her colonies and dependencies through the empire. After the Second World War, their popularity declined as air travel began to take over. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna launch into railways a bit. There's quite a bit on railways, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, there's two more images of people enjoying their uh, seaside break in Cleethorpes, 1909 and 1899, again, both from copy one. If you add up all the various railway companies that existed during the Victorian period in Britain, you will come to a figure of over 900 different railway companies. They didn't all exist at the same time. Some only lasted a short while and others were taken over by larger companies but each of them tried to secure a steady stream of customers. Those companies which were big enough to build stations in London tried to identify and encourage specific customer bases, holiday traffic being one such audience. Now we've got Fenchurch Street on the left and Paddington on the right. Fenchurch Street Station built in 1840 by the London and Blackwall Railway they focused on day trippers to Margate and Herne Bay, and they linked up with ships which sailed to Rotterdam in Holland and Antwerp in Belgium from Blackwall Pier. Paddington Station, built in 1854 by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the Great Western Railway's engineer, and he had the Great Western Royal Hotel built right at the front of the station. His hotel was the first of the large impressive London Railway hotels with 103 bedrooms and it was designed to look like a French chateau. Brunel's vision was for tourists to travel directly from London to New York on one ticket, staying at his hotel before travelling by his train to Bristol and then boarding his steamship, the Great Western, to New York. 
So he had it all planned out and sewn up. The next station we're looking at is Victoria Station, which opened in 1860, and this was effectively two railway stations in one. There was the Brighton side, run by the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway, and it was superior to the Chatham side, run by the London, Chatham and Dover Railway. The Brighton side catered for middle class clientele travelling to the country or to the south coast, while the Chatham side carried dock workers and merchant seamen to the east end of London. However, both sides catered for holiday traffic and the Chatham side introduced the family saloon in 1881, a special coach with toilet facilities and a large saloon in the center for family gatherings. There was also a second class compartment so that wealthy families could take their servants with them on holiday. In 1929, the luxury Golden Arrow train, comprising 10 first-class Pullman coaches, began a service to Dover, complementing the French version, known as the Flèche d'Or, which is basically Golden Arrow in French, which ran between Calais and Paris. This meant you could travel all the way from Paris to London in about six hours. Liverpool Street Station opened in 1874, run by the Eastern Counties Railway, and the company advertised holidays to the East Coast, which they called England's drier side, slightly less wet than the rest of England. Anyway, here we can see one of their advertising posters showing East Anglia with people fishing, swimming and playing golf with the strap line, meet the sun on the East Coast, England's drier side. There's also um, another ad advertisement, this time from the Great Eastern Railway magazine, 1911. It ad advertises holidays on the east coast of Britain. Um, and it says it's bright, breezy and bracing. Um, there are coastal resorts, charming countryside. They offer free illustrated guides to help you plan your holiday, cheap tickets, etc. So they're all trying to capture the, the holiday market in their own ways. Um, Blackfriars Station was opened in 1886 and produced booklets of day trips to Paris, Margate and Crystal Palace. And Marylebone Station opened in 1899 under the management of Sam Fay, who was the, the general manager of that company um, encouraged tourism to Stratford-upon-Avon, the Grand National and other bank holiday excursions. On the left we can see a poster showing the London and South Western Railway advertisement for holidays on the south coast and the southwest of England in 1904. Many locations are those which we would still choose today. On the right, we can see how opportunistic railway companies could be from a very early age. On Saturday, the 18th of May, 1844, Naworth Castle in Cumbria caught fire, possibly as a result of the ignition of some soot in the chimney of the Porter's Lodge. The castle suffered from a lack of internal walls, allowing the fire to spread rapidly, and it quickly spread to the northern wing. Although some property was saved, by the time two fire engines had arrived by, tra by train from Carlisle, most of the roof had collapsed and the fire had spread to nearly every room on the three sides of the quadrangle. And here we can see a poster advertising a special trip on the Newcastle and Carlisle Railway, encouraging people in an almost gleeful way to go and see the destruction of the celebrated baronial castle and to visit the ruins. Now, holiday camps. I expect we've all been to holiday camps. I remember going to Pontins with my parents at Canberra Sands when I was about 14. The first one, first holiday camp was opened in 1906 by John Fletcher Dodd, and it was the Caister Camp in Caister on Sea, Norfolk. And it was uh, one of the first holiday camps and later advertised itself as the oldest established camp. But 
accommodation was under canvas. In other words, it was just tents in a field. Inspired by visits to Caister Camp, Herbert Parr Potter, a solicitor's clerk from Norwich, opened a similar camp in Hemsby, Norfolk, called Potter's Camp in 1920. Potter's vision was to create a resort with the same friendly ambience, but with permanent timber-based structures instead of canvas tents. The camp moved to Hopton-on-Sea in 1925, and early Potter's Camp brochures proudly advertised that all huts were detached, had sea views, electric light, and tiled roofs. Known as sleeping huts for either single, double, or three-bed occupancy, they were described as conveniently furnished with beds fitted with spring mattresses, dressing table with a swing mirror, and a liberal supply of books. The camp's social scene involved the nightly dance after supper and special concerts and fancy dress dances with orchestral music. Its activities included billiards, table tennis, outdoor tennis, putting green, and bathing off the camp's private beach. Meals were served in a large communal dining hut and the camp itself prided itself on its unfettered open air life, good fellowship, and the entire absence of conventional fuss. In delightful ease, one can knock about in flannels from morning to night. What more delightful holiday can there be? It brings one closer to nature and creates new memories and sends one home sturdier, brighter, and happier, it says. Potter's achievement was, in effect, the forerunner of the quintessentially British holiday camp experience, which Billy Butlin replicated, first of all in Skegness in 1936, and at his many other camps throughout Britain and Ireland. And we can see Butlin's at Skegness here. Um, this is from a railway document, funnily enough. Um, so in the 1930s, camps took on a larger scale with the establishment of large chains. The first of these was Warner's, founded by Harry Warner, who opened his first site on Hailing Island in 1931, with another three opening before the outbreak of the Second World War. Dur during the early 1930s, Warner asked funfair entrepreneur Billy Butlin to join the board of his company and in 1935, Butlin saw the construction of Warner's holiday camp in Seaton, Devon. Butlin learned from the experience of Warner and he employed the same workers who had built the camp at Seaton to build his first camp under the Butlin's name at Skegness, Lincolnshire in 1936. By the outbreak of the Second World War, Butlin had two camps and a third under construction they proved really popular and after the war, there were around 200 holiday camps in the UK at different seaside locations. Now, change of gear. Um, I'm sure you recognize this. This is the, uh, a page from the 1921 census just released this year. Um, the 1921 census includes the details for 8.5 million households, as well as all manner of public and private institutions, including prisons, military bases, public schools, workhouses and hotels. The census was supposed to take place in April of 1921, but it was delayed by two months due to industrial unrest and was finally taken on the 19th of June 1921 mm -hmm. during the holiday season so consequently many people will be found listed in hotels instead of in their own homes. This slide shows a page for the Empress Hotel in Bournemouth which includes a fish merchant from Blackburn Lancashire, a motor engineer from Hammersmith, a civil servant surveyor from Whitehall, and a farmer from Andover in Hampshire, all listed as visitors to the hotel and on holiday in Bournemouth. Falling between the two world wars, the 1921 census paints a disparate picture of England and Wales, from the royal household to the average working class citizen, everyone in the country at the time is accounted for. 
At the time, the nation was still reeling from the impact of the First World War, a major housing crisis and the Spanish flu epidemic, as well as bearing the brunt of a ravaged economy and industrial turmoil. Due to the number of men killed in the First World War, there were over 1.7 million more women than men in England and Wales, the largest difference ever seen in a census. There was also a 35% increase in the number of people in hospital, again, probably due to First World War recoveries. Consequently, holidays were not really seen as a priority at this time. Now, hop picking. I don't know if you've come across this before. Hop picking in Kent. During the 1930s, around 40,000 people, usually women and children from London, would arrive in Kent for three weeks in September to pick hops. It was seen as a chance to swap city life for the fresh air of the countryside and was seen by many as a holiday, a kind of working holiday. This army of people would need somewhere to stay, so the invasion would include caravans, horse-drawn lorries, covered wagons and cars, all heading down to Kent. In the 1940s, comfortable huts were provided as shelter for the workers, and mobile canteens were sent by the Ministry of Food with ration cards issued for use in the local shops. In 1941, it's reported that 80,000 workers were in Kent bringing home the harvest. Hot picking as an occupation had been going since the 1870s and railway companies even provided hop picker specials to transport workers down south. But it was not always a happy time. If the harvest was poor, then wages could be low and there were reports of hop pickers tramping around looking for work. By the 1950s, machines had started to take over and in 1951, a machine was demonstrated at the Royal Show which could pick a thousand bushels a day and carry out the work of 80 hop pickers. This was the beginning of the end for the hop picking holiday. Now, um, this is the uh, photograph I mentioned, which isn't at the National Archives and I'll explain the one on the right in a second. This is about the influence of television um, the BBC Charter of Incorporation, which is on the left of the screen, um, the 20th of December 1926, um, the BBC, or the British Broadcasting Company, as it was originally called, um, was formed in 1922 by a group of leading wireless manufacturers, including Marconi. Although several scientists were all working on the new invention during the 1920s, it was Scottish engineer John Baird, John Logie Baird, who gave the world's first demonstration of true television before 50 scientists in central London in 1927. With his new invention, Baird formed the Baird Television Development Company, and in 1928, it achieved the first transatlantic television transmission between London and New York and the first transmission to a ship in mid-Atlantic. Baird is also credited with giving the first demonstration of both color and stereoscopic television. Invention of television broadened horizons in so many ways, including travel to other countries. Programs promoting foreign travel, such as the holiday series presented by Cliff Mitchell Moore, which is one of those people in the photograph on the right, which began in 1969 and was called Holiday 69, and it ran until the 1990s. ITV had its own version of the show called Wish You Were Here, presented by Judith Chalmers, and that ran from 1974 until 2003. <clears throat> now, the reason I've got that strange photo with everyone looking similar is because um, Cliff Mitchell Moore is, this was a, a lookalike competition and my dad entered it. And that's Cliff Mitchell Moore there. And that's my dad standing next to him, um, which I thought was quite an amusing photograph. It appeared in the, in the press, in the newspapers at the time. So uh, the last decade has seen a huge rise in travel shows filling our TV screens. They've moved from straightforward holidays 
to adventure and exploration. From Michael Palin, Louis Theroux and Richard E. Grant to Gino's Italian Escape, Las Vegas with Trevor McDonald and Countrywise with Ben Fogel. Whether you're on Netflix, Amazon Prime or a more traditional TV um, package, there's a travel show out there to inform, inspire and entertain everyone. Now, there's so much I could say about planes and cars. I'll just touch on them briefly. In 1903, the Wright brothers pioneering work in America on the concept of the aeroplane would pave the way for a breakthrough that would change the way the world experienced travel forever. Orville piloted the gasoline powered propeller driven biplane, which stayed aloft for only 12 seconds and covered 120 feet on its first flight. Pre-pandemic figures show that normal flight patterns for aircraft now provide for between 500 to 800,000 people in the air at any one time around the world. I think that's a bit low. It might even be a million people in the air now at any one time on different flights around the world. The early 1920s saw the rise of entrepreneurial employers such as Henry Ford, who provided higher wages that enable more people to travel for leisure purposes. Thanks to mass production, cars were now affordable and could be purchased by those other than just the very rich. The car quickly became the favorite mode of transport for holidaymakers because it was cheap and provided more freedom than steam trains. So um, I've got a couple of documents there. One is from an Air One um, letter uh, Wilbur Wright was writing to the Royal Aircraft Establishment in 1906 and we've got um, a Ford motor car again from copy one um, on the right there. Now airships, other forms of transport were also developing during this period. In 1928 the Graf Zeppelin made its first intercontinental trip traveling to New York it offered the first commercial transatlantic passenger flight service, and in 1929 it travelled around the world. In 1930 it visited Britain, as shown here. Graf Zeppelin made 590 flights, totalling almost 1.7 million kilometres, over a million miles. It was operated by a crew of 36 and could carry 24 passengers, so there was more crew than, than actual passengers. It was the longest and largest aircraft, airship, in the world when it was built. The Graf Zeppelin provided a commercial passenger and mail service between Germany and Brazil for five years. It was withdrawn in 1937 after another airship, the Hindenburg, caught fire and was destroyed, trying to dock with a mooring mast in New Jersey, USA, killing 35 people. People did not trust airship travel after this. Um, these images are from Air 11, which is um, papers of the Royal Airship Works, Cardington, and they include plans, memoranda and data referring to and photographs of various balloons, uh, rigid, non-rigid airships, both British and foreign. So it's quite a nice source for further research there. Okay, a couple of um, posters here. These are Second World War posters. And during the Second World War, people were encouraged to stay at home or at least to take a holiday working on a farm in order to help bring in the harvest. Money saved on holidays could then be invested in war savings bonds overseen by the Post Office Savings Department, originally set up in 1861. This has evolved over the years into its current form as National Savings and Investments, NSI, which today oversees premium bonds, among other savings products. Now, a bit of a change gear again, I'm afraid. Uh, mods and rockers <clears throat> into the 60s. In the early 1960s, bank holidays were sometimes marred by battles between rival gangs of mods and rockers who would gather in seaside towns to face each other down. Rockers wore leather jackets, rode powerful motorbikes and preferred 1950s American rock and roll music. 
whereas mods wore suits and parkas, rode Italian scooters and liked British bands such as the Yardbirds, Small Faces, The Who, and so on. During the Easter holidays in 1964, there were conflicts between mods and rockers at Margate, Hastings, Brighton and Clacton. On the left of the screen, you can see a press cutting from the People newspaper. This is from a Home Office file stating that mods and rockers were likely to turn up in Brighton, 50,000 of them, since the police presence there was seen as softer than at, Cle at um, Clacton, Margate or South End. The Home Office official sarcastically notes that those mods and rockers who read the People newspaper have now been told exactly where to go. On the right, we have a letter from Lord Shackleton, Minister of State for the Air Force, writing to the Home Office about their request to have two aircraft on standby at RAF Northolt over the Easter holiday period 1965 to fly in reinforcements from the Met Police to deal with any disturbances between mods and rockers along the south coast. Shackleton agrees to the suggestion as long as the, coast, the cost is paid for by the Home Office, but he says that he would not like to make this a regular bank holiday arrangement. Uh, another example of copy one and it's a variety of um, artworks here. These are this is related to bank holidays. There were more bank holidays added in the 70s. Uh, New Year's Day bank holiday, 1974. In 1975, most workers were entitled to at least two weeks paid holiday. And 1978 saw a May Day, a May Day holiday introduced. And 1979 was the first year that Britain spent more on overseas holidays than on staying in the UK. So 79 was when things began to change. The best ever years for the British seaside holiday were the early to mid 70s, when just over 40 million people had a holiday in the UK. During the 1950s and 60s, more and more people were going away on holiday in the UK under the uh, until the peak was reached in the mid 1970s. From the late 1970s onwards, the number of Britons holidaying abroad increased at a dramatic rate. The lure of guaranteed sunshine and cheap package holidays decimated the traditional British seaside holiday. The worst ever year was 1987, during the so-called Costa del Dol days of the 80s, Many boarding houses switched from offering accommodation to the unemployed instead of families on holiday. And a quick word about Concord. Um, it was on the 26th of September 1973 that Concord flew for the first time directly from Washington in the United States to Orly Airport in France crossing the Atlantic without stopping. With an average speed of 954 miles an hour, it was a French model of the Concorde, which took just three hours and 32 minutes to make the journey, smashing the previous record in half. A Boeing 747 would have taken more than seven hours for the same trip. Concorde began commercial flights in January 1976 with London to Bahrain and Paris to Rio services. In Britain, the development of Concorde was originally the responsibility of the Ministry of Aviation, with links to many other government departments, each of which had a Concorde division, which worked together under a directing committee. Consequently, the National Archives holds literally thousands of files concerning Concorde from many different departments across central government, such as the Foreign Office, the Board of Trade, Department of Industry, Ministry of Aviation, and the Civil Aviation Authority. These images are not of an actual Concorde, they're of a model, and um, they're from the Civil Aviation Authority, and they were testing what would happen if Concorde had to ditch in the sea or in a river. So they were just seeing how it performed by deliberately crashing these models into, uh, into water to see what would happen. One of the more unusual files 
uh, concerning Concord is from the Ministry of Health in 1969 regarding a request from officials at the Ministry of Technology. They wanted to monitor the effects of Concord's sonic booms and vibration on hospital buildings, medical equipment, timber structures and suspended ceilings, as well as any detrimental effects on people and livestock. As part of their investigations, they wanted to check whether the number of medical accidents increased as a result of sonic booms catching people by surprise. So they asked the Ministry of Health to conduct a survey across hospital accident and emergency departments. Obviously, they didn't want to uh, warn the patients or um, they didn't want the patients to know the purpose of the survey. So they were not allowed to mention Concord or sonic booms but the survey would consist of just two questions. The first question was, was there anything which startled or surprised you, causing you to have your accident? And the second question was, what was it? Not surprisingly, the Ministry of Health declined to get involved in such a survey. After 27 years of taking more than two and a half million passengers at speeds of 1,350 miles an hour, Concord's brief commercial life came to an end on the 24th of October 2003 when she made her last flight to London's Heathrow Airport from New York. She carried on board a host of celebrities including Joan Collins, Tony Benn and Sir David Frost. Now from one uh, French collaboration to another, the Channel Tunnel. Those of us who have been on holiday to France may have used the Channel Tunnel to get there. The Channel Tunnel opened in 1994, making it possible to travel from Britain to Europe by car or train. The tunnel is 50 kilometers long and connects Folkestone in Kent with Coquelle in France. The Queen and President Mitterrand officially opened the tunnel on the 6th of May, 1994. The Queen travelled from Waterloo to Calais at a sedate 80 miles an hour, while the President of France, France sped to the coast from Paris at double that, 186 miles per hour. The tunnel cost over four and a half billion pounds to build. Today, an average of 60,000 passengers pass through the tunnel each day, along with 4,600 trucks, 140 coaches and 7,000 cars. At the height of construction, 13,000 people were employed. Ten workers, eight of them British, were killed during the building the tunnel. The first proposal for a tunnel, first ever proposal uh, for a tunnel under the channel, was put forward in 1802 by Albert Matthew, a French engineer, and his plans included a horse-drawn coach going backwards and forwards, an artificial island halfway across for changing horses, and oil lamps for illumination. Further proposals were considered by Napoleon III in 1856 and William Gladstone in 1865, while David Lloyd George brought up the idea at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. So it took 200 years to finally start the tunnel in 1988. The undersea portion of the tunnel remains the longest in the world at 23 and a half miles long. And it takes 35 minutes to travel through the tunnel and the lining of the tunnel is designed to last for 120 years. So we've got to the final slide. Um, I'm not sure how, yep, I've, I've filled up the time quite well, I think. Um, what of the future? Well, from June 2019 to December 2021, less than 20% of Britons took a holiday this, in, in that period due to the coronavirus restrictions. At the height of the health crisis in 2020, 73% of adults surveyed said they hadn't had a holiday and COVID as well as the war in Ukraine and the increase in the cost of living are likely to restrain any upward trend in holiday making for the foreseeable future. For 2022, holiday companies report that three quarters of adults intend to take some kind of holiday this year. And those um, of those, 
a third plan to go to the usual places like Cornwall or the Lake District or Edinburgh. Before COVID, two thirds of people would have opted for a hotel stay, but this is likely to drop to around 40% this year. But overall, travel companies are optimistic that businesses will continue to climb back to two thirds of pre-pandemic levels this coming year. Um, and that's where we come to the end of our holiday jaunt. Um, thank you for listening. I hope you found it interesting. Um, and if nothing else, I hope the images have served to show you the breadth of material at the National Archives and that you can literally research almost any topic at the National Archives, even if you've never uh, come across it before, uh, which is the case here, um, since this was put together specially for this evening. So um, thank you for listening and um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, that, that was really interesting talk. Um, and I've, I've got to say, you know, the, the pictures that you've shared in your slides are, are actually fantastic. Um, the, the ones in particular that I thought were great were the, the ones of Cleethorpes, of the, the, the crowds along the promenade, and then the couple of pictures of people paddling in the sea. I thought they were fa fantastic. Uh, they're nice, aren't they? Yeah, they're very atmospheric. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think even the last one you just had that up there of you know Bogner Regis just you know showing the the um, the carts that go into the sea for people to change and then walk into the sea. Yes, you, you know just how things have changed, but it's um, yeah, it, it's fa fantastic. Um, I, I was also intrigued um, about Thomas Cook there. You know, oh, yes. a, a shilling for a train ride, you, you, you know, so tongue in cheek. Uh, I'm just wondering how much of a rip off that was at the time. <laughs> but um, yeah. um, I'll just put my video back on. But 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 that but that was great. And it was very interesting that it was a train ride as well for his mm. first trip. Um, yeah. People there. <laughs> um, as and, and I think the. I was making some notes as you were talking and one, one of you actually covered one of my points that I was going to talk to you about here, but I was really interested in um, the workers from London and the North coming from coal mines and, you know, more factory style um, jobs into the hop picking. Um, they're taking time off. Um, and treating that actually as a holiday to 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 actually do that. I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah. But, but I was, I, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but you know, in terms of um, how they could take three weeks away from their normal job to go and do another job, um, I, I, I guess they were encouraged to do that by the government at the time. I think um, the answer might be that they were mainly women and children. That yeah that were um, doing the hot picking. So they would leave their husbands behind doing their normal jobs, their um, coal mining and farming and so on. Yeah. And it would be just um, the children going off with their mum and their aunties um, to, to help get the harvest in and in particular the hops. So yeah, I think that's the way around it. They, they didn't really have jobs that they were leaving behind. These were extra. Uh. Okay, that, that explains it. Um, so, so obviously the National Archives has been a complete treasure of information for you, uh, pulling all this together. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so as you were going through this, what was the thing that really caught your eye and piqued your interest as you're doing this research? Um, I'm gonna kind of give a, a dodgy answer to this because the, <laughs> as I said, I've said a couple of times I've never looked into the history of holidays before apart from when I was asked to give this talk and when you think of holidays they're mostly run by private companies and the National Archives doesn't have private company records it has central government records and records from the law courts but despite that I've managed to put a talk together using government records um, and that's the that's the important thing I think to take away, which is that no matter what the subject matter is, 
there will probably be something at the National Archives that you can use for your talk or your research or your book or whatever you're doing, even though you might think, oh, there won't be anything there because it's just government records. There will be something there. I mean, I tried it the other day. I was looking at random things like budgerigars, and there are records that come up with budgerigars in, and they might not be what you're actually looking for, but it's worth a try, you know, and you will hit on anything if you, you just you just want to have a look and and do your own research whether it's ufos or knitting patterns or musical instruments whatever you're interested in it doesn't mean that there's nothing there simply because we've only got government records that sounds so restrictive and boring you know you know, it's just going to be old um, ministry of defense papers and things no it's not it's anything you can usually find something so that's what I would take away. Um, I don't... think that's a great point to make. You, 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 you know, the depth of information and records and um, uh, as a, that the National Archives have is, is tremendous. And I think you make that point really well there. Oh, um, thank you. We, we, we've got a question from Nova Smith. Um, so uh, the question is, does the, the, the wake weeks also cover Scotland Wales and Ireland? Um, I think it was mostly England. From what I've picked up, I think it was mostly the, and not only England, but it was the north. It was the Lancashire area, perhaps Durham, Yorkshire. It was mostly uh, the industrial, what you would might say now is the industrial north, um, because it was mostly factories rather than farms and that sort of thing. It was it was factory workers that um, all went on holiday at the same time so that they could close the factory. And while they were away, the factory could be refurbished or cleaned or whatever. Um, but they didn't want to close the whole of the north down so that it would be one week, one area, another week, another area, and so on. So it was staggered. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure that it, that, that that took place in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland so much, as far as I know. Um, just got a, 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 another question that's just come in here. So from Fiona um, Kasky, hopefully yes. I've pronounced that correctly. Um, Scotland, if I remember, they used to close for certain weeks or weekends, e.g. Glasgow would have uh, a holiday, then Edinburgh. Oh, okay. There we uh, go. <laughs> um, so, so where we are, you, you you brought the talk up to where we are at the moment, and you know the last couple of years we've all suffered with COVID. Um, one of the key themes that you know uh, I, I think has gone through your talk is how transportation and the development of transport has really influenced um, holidays. And you know how transport enables people to you know travel to different places. Yeah. Um, so here we are, 2022. What are your thoughts about the future? And does Elon Musk feature in your thoughts? Uh, no, uh, I think that would be too expensive. Um, you mean going into space? Um, well, I think if you look at the general trend, it was. Uh, the idea of a holiday was to have a break and it was just to go to the seaside. Then it became in the 70s, oh, you have to go abroad. And so you'd go to Spain or Italy or Greece. And then more latterly, it's you've got to go a bit further. So it's the Bahamas or America or Canada and Australia. But there's only certain, you can't go any further than Australia really until you start coming back on yourself. So I think what will happen is people will, seek different kind of thrills so there'll be um themed holidays which you can already get you can you can go on a james bond themed windmill holiday in norfolk you can have a hollywood themed barge holiday in um, the albert dock in liverpool and there's um you can stay in a tp a north american indian tp and live as if you're a Cochise or um, an Apache or somebody. So 
I think people want experience, will, will want experiences instead of just going to foreign countries now. So um, I think that might be the trend in the future. And it's certainly what I, I've come across uh, when I was looking through what people go for now. It's the, it's the themed adventure rather yeah. than just lying on a beach somewhere. And, and, and it could well be also that actually the last two years where people have actually because of the restrictions we've had have holidayed more in their home country um, a lot of people are actually discovering um, what the home country has actually got to offer uh, so that may even see a kind of a a return to holidaying uh, in your own home country um, yeah. which is great great for the yeah, economy um, definitely before we wrap up, there's just one more comment that's come in from uh, Melvin Draper. Um, in the ZS PC11 collection, we've got lots of railway holiday tickets and advertising dating from 1914 to 1916, but less after that. Have you come across anything in the archives to show government taking action to restrict this? Um, I can't say I have, no. It's not something that I've, um, I've that, that sticks out. Um, what, the, the fact that... Uh, the fact that I think, it, I think what Melvin's saying, the fact that it doesn't go beyond 1916. Oh, yeah. okay. No, I haven't really noticed that. No, that needs looking into, doesn't it? So, um, yeah. yeah. But okay. uh, I'm familiar with ZSPC 11. Yeah, that's a fantastic resource. Well, look, um, on behalf of everyone, Chris, I'd just like to say thank you ever so much. That was really interesting. Great <laughs> pictures on, on the slides. And, okay. and again, what a what a source the National Archives is for this kind of information. So Absolutely. thank you very much. And um, that, that's it for this evening. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you, Graham.